Hello, my name is Jennifer Hackney, and I'm the Material Culture Educator at the Mariners Museum and Park. And today I'm going to share with you a hopefully exciting program uh, titled Money Makes the World Go Round, Ancient Greek Coinage. And my foray into looking into numismatics or the study of coin began a few months ago when I came across an article in the Virginian Pilot about a couple who had collected coins over, this, over the course of about 60 years, many of which had come from antiquity and is really one of the largest coin collections or private collections on the East Coast. And they ended up do, donating it to a museum in the Outer Banks. And I thought, of course, well, what does our museum have? Do we have any uh, ancient coinage? Where do we sit uh, in antiquity within our collections? And I'll have to say that I was pleasantly surprised by some of the items that our collection holds. And some of the information is actually a little bit lacking on what the coins actually depict. And so some of this is really my investigation into who or what is actually on the coins that we have, specifically as they relate to one collection inside of our larger collection. So I wanna start with this coin first because it was the first one that I actually encountered and it's so beautifully preserved that even though it isn't in the specific collection that we'll be spending most of our time with, I did want to share some information on it. So this coin is 2,300 years old. It is from the fourth century BCE and we have it labeled as silver Phoenicia erratus uh, with a floating galley on the reverse and a figure on the obverse. When I looked into similar coins in various collections throughout the world, I found that some labeled this figure on the obverse, which is the front, either Zeus or Poseidon. But I found this really interesting because those are Greek deities and where this coin likely comes from, uh, Arados is not actually one of the Greek city-states. And so I started looking a little bit deeper and I think that who this figure is that is wearing a laureate on his head is the figure Melkart. And his name actually translates to King of the City. He was the patron god and head of the Pantheon of Tyre, which is just across the water from Arados. It is a Phoenician city-state rather than a Greek city-state. Our Melkart here is also referred to as Baal de Sor or the Lord of Tyre. And he's actually associated with monarchy, commercial trade, the sea, and colonization, which makes that galley on the reverse make sense. Melkart is actually known in many Semitic religions, and he could likely be the Baal that is mentioned in the Tanakh. He is linked to the Greek Heracles and the Roman Hercules, and he's often actually called the Tyrian Hercules. So he is one of great strength and power. But this was not the coin that I was most uh, taken back by. It was actually a series of coins held by Commodore John Rogers. Commodore John Rogers had a mysterious box that when I typed into our catalog, Greek coins, a wooden box came up and I was curious to learn more. Why would a box be associated with a series of coins? So a little history on Commodore John Rogers. The Rogers family as a whole played a very large role in founding the American Navy. His father, Colonel John Rogers, was actually a Scotch emigre to the American colonies prior to the American Revolution. And he was a large proponent of the Patriot cause. And Commodore John Rogers naturally followed in his father's footsteps. He served for nearly 40 years and under six presidents in the Navy's nascency. He served in the Quasi War with France, the First Barbary War, the Second Barbary War, and the War of 1812. Then, from 1815 to 1837, he served on the Board of Naval Commissioners and ended up dying one year after his retirement. His son, John Rogers Jr., and his four grandsons all served in the U.S. Navy. And here is the box that he has. Uh, alongside it was this ledger that contained notes of all the coins that were actually held inside of this box. The box held 16 coins in total, all of which appear to originate in antiquity, so ancient Greece and Rome. 
two thirds of these coins are from Greece or neighboring city states. And I believe that he gained these coins when he was actually commanding the Mediterranean squadron from November 1824 to May 1827. This image of Commodore John Rogers is from our collection, but I don't know that it quite does him justice. So I wanted to include this painting by John Wesley Jarvis of Commodore John Rogers that is actually on display at the National Gallery of Art. So these 16 coins were held a bit maybe carelessly inside of the box. So the coins that we have show quite a bit of love. Some of them are hard to decipher what they are. And so through this, I'm going to show similar coins that I have found in order to decipher what these coins may have. But I also needed to know where exactly do these coins lie in terms of numismatic history. So let's figure out a little bit about the origination of coins, because our coins do tie into the first ever minted coins. So as far as we know, the first true minted coins came out of Asia Minor in an area called Lydia, which is in Phoenicia, but outside of the proper Greek city states. And this is something that I really like. As far as we know, the first known or the oldest known, it's really hard when talking about history to actually make the statement the first to the last, it's never or always. And that's because there's a chance that something new can always be uncovered. It was actually only about two months ago that the oldest known cave painting was discovered in a cave in Sulawesi, Indonesia. They, archaeologists found a pig that was painted 45,500 years ago. And up until this moment, about two months ago, it was actually believed that the oldest known cave paintings were 44,000 years old. And they did come from the same cave complex in Sulawesi. So we're always finding out new information. So as far as we know, the first coins came out of Lydia. And even Herodotus, the Greek historian, stated the same in saying, so far as we have any knowledge, they, the Lydians, were the first people to introduce the use of gold and silver coins, and the first who sold, go sold goods by retail. So from what we know, our oldest known minted coins uh, came from this area of Lydia that I've highlighted on the map. This is now actually modern day Turkey and the coins originated around 625 BC. Prior to this, coins may have been made of electrum slug, some chopped off metal. There may have been some striations on bits of metal that were being traded. But when we talk about the first coins, we are talking about ones that are minted by a government entity. Our first coins were made of electrum, and this is a naturally occurring alloy of silver and gold that actually happens near Lydia. They were found under a temple, uh, under the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, which I've circled in blue. And Ephesus is actually one of the Greek city states, but Lydian forces would actually try to control Ephesus. And so these coins were actually found in a hoard under the temple. This is not, however, the first time that precious metals were used in currency. Prior to the Lydian government minting coins, not only would there be slugs of electrum with maybe some striations, but mercenaries and merchants would use rings or ingots of metal. Uh, but this ended up being a tedious process of weighing the metal, uh, determining the actual purity of the metal and deciding if this was worth time. With a government entity in charge of minting, coin standards and weights were actually put into place and this eliminated the time consuming task of weighing and ensuring purity of whatever metal was being traded. And this was preferred by merchants who were desiring standardization and a stamp from an issuing entity. If your coin or your slug of metal has a stamp, then this means that it has been verified by some issuing authority, much like our coins today. These were some of the coins that were actually found under the temple in Ephesus. What we have are an image on the obverse, which is the front, and on the reverse are inkyu squares. These are hammer marks from when a coin is actually punched. On one of these, we have the Lydian lion with his mouth open and the sun behind his head. 
And on the bottom one, we have a stag uh, that is grazing pointed towards the right. And there's actually a phrase associated with this particular coin. This is a really curious coin and there's only about 12 known of this specific one on the bottom that exists. And it is marked with the word fanes. Uh, and there's a phrase associated with this that says, I am the badge or sign of fanes, which means light. So I am the badge of light. And there's curiosity around what this means. Was fanes a person? Was it an entity? We don't really know yet. Uh, but we do think that the stag is likely a symbol of Artemis as the deer was the symbol of Artemis. And so it makes sense that the stag coin would have been found under the temple. These were minted in the Lydian government and they were made from this electrum. However, in 550 BCE, King Croesus of Lydia decided to replace electrum with pure gold coins and he called these crochets. These coins feature specifically one image on the, obver on the obverse and two in Q squares, just like the previous on the reverse. The Khrushchev specifically has a lion with his mouth open fighting a bull. These coins from 550 mark a specific change where pure metals were being used rather than alloys. And eventually we find that coins are replaced, uh, the in Q squares on the reverse are replaced with imagery. And this is where ancient Greece really shines. Ancient Greece ended up taking this idea that the Lydians had and they ran with it. So I wanted to show you this map again because it highlights some of the larger uh, Greek city states. It also shows the more tribal areas that may have a difference uh, in how they mint their coins. At the height of ancient Greece during the classical period, there were over 2000 city states or polis, and half of these minted their own coin, which means roughly 1000 individual governing city states had their own specific coin. And here is a map that shows just a sampling of what those coins may be. There were three main standards or ways of measuring weight and dimension of these coins, most of which ended up being made from silver. This is our difference between Lydian and Greek coins is silver versus gold. The three main standards are the Athenian drachma, which would be 4.3 grams of silver, the Corinthian stotter, which is 8.6 grams of silver, or the very less used Agenetian stotter or didrachum, which is 12.2 grams of silver, which would make their uh, drachma 6.1 grams. This standard ends up uh, not being featured much at all. Eventually, everyone in Greece ends up adapting the Attic standard or the one coming out of Athens. One way to actually identify coins uh, from different city states is that usually what is on the front or the obverse of the coin is a deity or patron god of that city. Um, and then on the reverse is either a symbol of that deity or a symbol of the city, something that the city is known for, like a good that they export. Uh, for example, Thessaly would export and breed horses or it might be a something that they are sort of known for having. Um, Nosos uh, had the Minotaur as one of their symbols um, or the labyrinth. Uh, Ephesus, interestingly, where we find those oldest coins, when they eventually start minting their own coins, uh, their obverse includes an image of their patron god Artemis. And then the symbol of Ephesus was the B. And so this is typically what you find on the reverse of an Ephesian key uh, coin. So these standards, what do they mean? Well, what I find really interesting is that the phrasing actually links to pre-numismatic times, so before we're minting coins. The word drachma means handful or to literally grasp. This nomenclature does come from pre-coinage time when something could be valued off of the length of a piece of iron. A drachma is broken up into ovals and ovals are broken up into spits. 
and six spits equals one handful. And we can see this here, how they would measure the spit like a rotisserie spit, so that length of iron to determine its value. And this actually relates back to the trading of pure metal and especially iron when iron was valued for its tools. All of this ultimately means that drachma, a currency used in Greece until 2002, relates back to pre-numismatic time. And the word obol is still used today and it's slang in Greece meaning little monies. And the word obelisk actually means little spit, which I find really funny that even our own Washington Monument, which is not something that can easily be held in one's hand, actually translates to little spit. Now, something really important to know about Greek coins is that they are all struck by hand. And this makes it pretty easy to identify a counterfeit coin. If it has not been struck by hand, if it is cast, then that means that there is a different entity that actually made that coin. So how do they make these coins? Well, you have a metal blank of pure silver that is placed in between two die. The die have the images cut into it and you place a punch on top of it when it sits on an anvil and then you hammer it. And by hammering this heated metal, you actually get the design on both sides. And this is not a process that can be done uh, as an individual. You definitely need to do this uh, with a group of people. You need somebody maintaining the heat of a fire to actually create the long slug of metal. You have one person carry the slug of metal over to the anvil, cutting it into specific dimensions, placing it, placing that blank in between the two die and then having another person punching the design into it. This could be done with two people, but definitely preferable to have three. So in order to understand why Greek coin ends up being what is kind of referred to as the first widespread minting of coin, it's important to understand the ancient Greek economy. And it really is just all about wheat and Athens. Athens ends up becoming a hub of maritime commerce. They traded olives, wine, and grapes for wheat and silver from Asia Minor until they eventually find their own silver and exploit those mines themselves, uh, many silver mines on the larger peninsula of Greece. In fact, Socrates said that nobody is qualified to become a statesman, statesman who is entirely ignorant of the problem of wheat. Only about 20% of Greece could actually be farmed and the citizens of Athens needed to eat. And so therefore we get this large co-effort of having to import in wheat and seeing that mercenaries preferred coin and because of this silver mining becomes monetized. Uh, the banking and investment system in ancient Greece was actually really sophisticated. Because silver mining became monetized, groups of investors would actually work together uh, inside of their sophisticated banking system so that people could actually start and invest their mines together and mint their own money uh, while at the same time mitigating the risk of starting a silver mine uh, alone. So how does this all go back to wheat? Well, they needed imported grain to feed a third of their citizens and to understand how large Athens was, two thirds of all imported grain was regulated to go to Athens. This places Athens at the pinnacle of the Greek economy because they needed to import this wheat. Because of long distance trading and the need to profit and ensure a wealthy venture, this is how we see this explosion of coin. The two are ultimately related to each other. There is a legal and financial framework that is actually set up to import this grain. Coin was recognized as the preferable way to pay people. It was preferred by Greek mercenaries and the preferable import was wheat. 
And so there were massive uh, sophisticated maritime loan contracts that were actually set up that regulated where merchants could go, when they were to leave, how quickly they needed to come back, what they were picking up, and where what they picked up went. Uh, and if this was not done in an expected time, the owner of that ship would actually be responsible for their loan contract, and they would have to fill this contract, uh, they would have to pay it in full. And in order to actually get paid for these contracts they were taking loans out on, their mercenaries would have to come back with the appropriate amount of wheat. Now there was something called the bottom rate rule, which essentially meant that maritime trade is pretty dangerous and it is a long haul. If a ship sinks, well, then you're out of your loan obligation. So this bottom rate rule ensured that any merchants uh, wouldn't be out too much money if their ship did in fact sink. It's a bummer. However, most, mo most mercenaries would actually have multiple contracts. So it wasn't the end of the world if they lost a ship or two. So all of this then supports Athens becoming the coin standard throughout the Grecian empire. And this is because this was the primary coin being traded. It was the one that was preferable. This is what people recognized as the most desirable coin was the Athenian owl. It was called the Athenian owl because on the obverse, we have an image of Athena. And on the reverse, we have Athena's symbol of wisdom, the owl. And we have the alpha, omega, and epsilon that are the symbols of Athens. So in order to understand just how sophisticated this uh, legal and financial framework was in Athens and how everyday citizens actually understood the exchanging of money, I have a quote that I'm going to read from a legal dispute. In Athens, there were open courts and juries of peers and financial trials would actually be held in public. Now, if you were wealthy, you could hire a wordsmith to defend your case, but most citizens did not have that kind of wealth and so they would have to defend themselves. This quote comes from a dispute between an uncle and nephew. The nephew was disputing his inheritance uh, from a sofa manufactory. And the quote says, my sofa manufactory employing 20 slaves given to my father as a security for a debt of 40 minai. These brought him a clear income of 12 minai. In money he left as much as a talent loaned at the rate of a drachma a month the interest of which amounted to more than seven minai a year. Now, if you add to this last sum, the interest for 10 years reckoned at a drachma only, you will find that the whole principal and interest amounts to eight talents and 4,000 drachma. So there is this really sophisticated understanding of time value money and interest payments. So thus, our Athenian, uh, intellect regarding finance is pretty strong and does also support why the Athenian coin or the Athenian owl was most desirable for trade. Today, the most desirable coin is this coin, which comes from Syracuse, uh, comes from Sicily and the area of Syracuse. This is the absolute epitome of coinage artistry, and these coins were, will sell for six figures if you can find them. They are the most desirable collectible today. This is a tetradrachm or 10 drachmas, and these coins are often made by uh, and signed by one of two artists, Kimon and Ioannitos. These were coin engravers who became rather famous. This coin is actually by Ioannitos and it features a charioteer on the reverse, although the two sides are flipped. And he is charioting a quadriga. Nike is flying in to crown him as winner and below is a panoply of armor. On the obverse, we have the head of Arethusa, who was a smaller deity, but the deity of Syracuse. And she is surrounded by four dolphins wearing a crown of reeds. 
She was actually, uh, her story is that she rose up from the water, creating a water fountain in Syracuse, thus all of her ties to the water. So now to get to our coins. Greek numismatic periods actually fall into Greek art periods. And I'm going to present some of the coins from Commodore John Rogers collection in that order. And I'm also gonna show at least one work of art or I'm gonna show one work of art from those Greek time periods so that you can also see some visual similarities that exist in the coins. And I'm also going to show a similar coin that I was able to find in other coin collections in order to show clear imagery of what these coins depict. The archaic period of Greek art and Greek numismatics starts in the seventh century BCE and goes up to 480 BCE. This particular coin is called a Pegasus Stotter of Corinth and dates between 550 and 515. Until the hoard under the temple of Artemis was found, it was actually believed that the, current, that the coin of King Croesus was actually the oldest known coin. And so for a time period, we may have thought that we had one of the oldest coins known since this dates from the time of the Croesides. This is one of our oldest and the smallest object in our collection. And here we can see a similar coin from the same time period. What we have on the obverse is a Pegasus. He is a winged horse that below him is the symbol of the Kappa, which is the letter that represents Corinth, where this comes from. The Pegasus is also a symbol of Corinth. And so here we have two symbols of Corinth and we can sort of see that Kappa right here on our coin we can see the very knobby knees of the Pegasus. On the reverse are four incus marks that are referred to as a quadripartite, and it consists of a swastika. This, however, is a left-facing swastika that is composed of four gammas, the Greek letter gamma, and this is actually called a gamadion, and it's actually an auspicious lucky symbol. And this horse here, or the Pegasus here, just like ours, is actually very similar to archaic Greek art. So here is the death of a Sarpedon crater by Euphronios. This is actually a red figure style piece of terracotta in which red figures are formed by the absence of black slip. Terracotta is a red body clay and then black slip would be painted on it before it was fired. What we can see here are similarities in form, not only between these very angular geometric wings on our winged figures at left and right to that of our Pegasus and his hair or his mane, but we can also see a similar angularity and geometric form in the Pegasus's knobby knees and ankles, very similar to the knobby knees that we have on our Sarpedon who has fallen, as well as his very geometric musculature. This is a stylization that is almost abstract in form. It displays a somewhat lack of realism that is a holdover from Egyptian art, but a leaning towards the realism that is to come at the height of Greek art. So our next period are the classical coins. The classical period is primarily what Greek art is known for. The classical time period is from 480 BCE to 330 BCE. And the coin here we have is a federal coinage from Phocis or the Phocian League and dates from 478 to 460 BCE. Phocis or Phocis was an ancient federation of 20 townships that included the city of Delphi or Delphi. It was located in central Greece and served as a crossroads for much of Greek history and religion, being divided by Mount Parnassus and included the Pass of Thermopylae, the city of Doria, and the Oracle of Delphi. The coin features a bull on the obverse and the profile image of the god Artemis on the reverse. This is rather curious because all similar uh, coins that I have found all state that Artemis is on the reverse instead of the obverse. And here we can see a similar coin where we have Artemis on the reverse facing left and the bull on the obverse 
facing forward. It was actually somewhat difficult to find a similar coin because in Focus, many of the coins actually feature Poseidon, and it was difficult to find a patron god or goddess of Focus since it is a federation of 20 townships, and each individual township could have its own patron deity. It is possible that this bull that is on the obverse represents a bull sacrifice that would be made during the Pythian community festivals that were typical in the Phokian League. However, I think, especially based on the date, that the bull on the obverse represents the bronze bull statue that the Corsarians dedicated in 480 BCE to commemorate what was an especially hefty catch of tuna. According to Greek geographer Pausanias, herders in Corfu noticed one day that a bull kept fleeing his flock and he would head to the water. Eventually they followed him and found a sea full of fish. Yet for some reason they were unable to catch any and this became dire for them as they needed the fish desperately. The citizens of Corfu finally went and it sought advice from the Oracle at Delphi. He told them to sacrifice a bull to Poseidon. And after they did this, they were finally able to catch this fish, that sizable catch of tuna. They then took the proceeds that the fish, that the fish afforded them and they erected that bronze bull statue that is clearly represented in this second image. And so I think rather than it just being the bull sacrifice, that they may do yearly. It was the special bull sacrifice that related to one great haul of tuna. And I believe that bronze bull still stands today. Here's another example of a classical coin from our collection. We actually have two very similar coins that have a Pegasus on the reverse and a deity on the obverse. This is specifically a silver drachm from Corinth. So it makes sense that we have that Pegasus, just like that first, uh, the silver Pegasus daughter from Corinth. This coin dates from 350 to 306 BCE. So it's right on the line between classicism and Hellenism, which is the second period uh, or third period of Greek art. And here is a similar coin. We can see the Pegasus in a slightly more attenuated form with the kappa below. We can see the kappa here on our coin. The deity depicted is likely Aphrodite who was wearing a sakos, which was a decorative headband that allowed hair curly tendrils to flow out the back. Aphrodite was the protector goddess of Corinth, not necessarily the patron god or goddess, but the protector goddess. And the Acropolis in Corinth, or the Acro Corinth, was actually dedicated to Aphrodite. Aphrodite was common on the drachm, but Athena was often seen on the stotter. I find this a bit curious, and here is an example of that. We see again the Pegasus with arched wings, the kappa below, and here is Athena wearing a large Corinthian helmet and behind her is the symbol Delta and then a Quiros behind her to the right. I find this curious because Athens was the rival city of Corinth. So why on a coin worth two drachma depict the goddess Athena? Instead, I think there might actually be a difference uh, for who this deity could potentially be. I think it might be Belephoron. He was a symbol of Corinth as he was given a golden bridle by Athena to tame and defeat the Pegasus. And we'll come back to him at the end. So of course I want to show you an example of classical art. The classical period is considered the pinnacle of ancient Greek art. It was a time of humanism, democracy, Socrates and Plato. This is when we see the emergence of Greek orders of architecture, when those orders are perfectly defined, specifically by Vesuvius. And towards the end of the classical period was the reign of Alexander the Great. 
This is a time of enhanced realism and idealism of form in art. It's where we see the introduction of contrapposto, which is placing weight on one leg and relaxing the other. This is considered the most natural stance. And this is something that is adopted by the Renaissance artists when they look back to Greek art. Renaissance art specifically looks back to the classical period of art. We can see a very similar form in the face here of Praxiteles Aphrodite of Nidos to the Aphrodite that we see on our coin. We also see those same curly tendrils coming out of the back of her head as we see in Praxiteles sculpture. And we see a softening of her features. We can also see a similar softening from those knobby knees that we saw on the archaic coin to the more realistic knees of this Pegasus. We also see a much more natural definition of musculature on this Pegasus. So that takes us to Hellenism, which is my favorite time of Greek art. Hellenism was from 330 BCE to 31 BCE. And this was a time when Greek culture spread around the known part of the world. Greek speaking kingdoms were established in Egypt, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, and India. Greek traders spread Greek coins across this area. And this was the time when Greek coin began to be seen everywhere. And these new kingdoms that were established actually start minting their own coin. And there is a stark difference between the coin that these new kingdoms were minting versus what was being minted in Greece. These new kingdoms were much larger and wealthier than the Greek polis of classical period. These coins that were made in the new kingdoms were mass produced and were usually in gold. This is a time when we might find cast coins, which is starkly different from the punched coins or struck coins of ancient Greece. And they're very different from the Greek coinage that was still being made. Typically Hellenistic coins from these kingdoms, of which we do not have examples, often feature portraits of living people, namely kings. The Greek citizens who saw this found this to be an incredible display of hubris, but the kings of Ptolemaic Egypt and Seleucid Syria had bestowed themselves with divine power as kings, ultimately linking themselves to various deities. These were magnificent coins with a portrait in profile and usually a symbol of state on the reverse. So we're beginning to see profile images of current leaders and symbols of that state rather than some good that the area is known for or a symbol of a deity. This tradition ended up being adopted by the Romans and is actually still maintained today. This is exactly what we see on our coinage, usually an architectural building, which is a symbol of state on our reverse and on the obverse, we will see a profile image of a current leader, of past leaders. Now, Hellenism was a time of great spread, but it also began the downfall of Greece. They end up falling to Rome in 146 BC when they become a Roman province. And works of art during this time display a sense of reality with heightened drama and emotion. The coins sort of follow suit. This particular coin is a Greek drachm from Rhodes and is dated 188 to 170 BCE. And here we have a very similar, almost identical coin. Now what's interesting about Rhodes is that rather than depict a symbol of their area, a good, something they're known for, or a symbol of their deity. Instead, they choose a play on words for the image that is depicted on the reverse. They opt for the rose. This is more of a play on words because the word for rose, or the word for, the Greek word for rose is rhodon, which is quite similar to rhodes. And then on the obverse, we actually see uh, an image of Helios. He is the sun god and Rhodes patron deity, and he is wearing a sun radiant crown. And we can see that same crown on our coin. Now this series of coins was actually quite rare. And we see a rose punched inside of an NQ square. These coins, just like this one, 
in our collection are called plinthophoric coins, or they come from a plinthophoric series. And this is something that was only ran between 190 and 184 BCE. And they derive their name from plinthos, which means brick. Essentially, it was named for the exact stone that it was struck on. The rose design was carved into a small plinth rather than taking up the entire reverse of the coin like our previous coins. Here is another coin from Hellenistic Greece. It is a Macedonian coin and beyond that, our collection doesn't offer much insight into who or what is depicted. Based on many similar coins that I was able to find, it can safely be said that this is a tetraoval with a wreathed maynod uh, on the obverse and the stern of a galley on the reverse. All are depicted with their head facing right and the galley is leaving to the left. Each maynod is wearing a wreath in their head, has slightly wild hair above that wreath, a necklace and an earring. The Maenads were the free-loving followers of Dionysus, and they were actually called the Raving Ones. They were the most significant members of the Theosis, or the God's retinue. The name comes from Maenads, which means mad or demented. And this is because during the orgiastic rites of Dionysus, these Raving Women would roam mountains and forests, apparently possessed by the God, and they would perform frenzied dances. They could possess gifts of prophecy and superhuman strength. They would prepare Dionysus's wine and they would also drink it, which was believed to be the way that they gained access to this possessed state. In Macedonia, the cult of Dionysus was incredibly popular. And so there is an easy explanation for including his loyal followers to be, to be depicted on the obverse of the coin. And all of these coins feature the Greek letters for Macedonia. We can see that on our coin together, and all of these have Macedonia split above and below the galley. Now this coin is very likely counterfeit. It is labeled as ancient coin of Euboea Histiaia. And we believe it's counterfeit because it is very likely cast. There are marks that are straight rather than circular. We can even see that the design on both obverse and reverse seems just not quite right compared to the real Greek coin. The figure is curiously similar to the Maynard from before. However, we believe that this is the nymph Histiaia, which just like in this coin is depicted on the front, on the obverse and on the reverse. She is wreathed in ivy, she wears an earring and necklace. And on the reverse, she is seated on, the, on a galley uh, holding a stylus on the reverse. And we still have this counterfeit coin, which I love, a little controversy in our collection. For comparison, here is our work of Hellenistic art. The Greeks were starting to feel the pressure of falling to Rome. They had endured many defeats in war and really they, the Greek empire had gotten a bit too big. As such, their art is less idealized. It's more realistic. Many sculptures show death or defeat like this defeated boxer. We can see that he is not just one. His form is not perfect. His hands are tired, his shoulders are slumped over and his head is turned to the side, almost as though he is watching his opponent walk off in glory. And we can see some of that in these coins. There seems to be a heavier weight to the faces. There is much more heavy dramatic carving in the coins. And they also almost seem to feel the weight of impending defeat. Our last period of coin is the Roman provincial period. 
There isn't really a similar period of Greek art. Technically speaking, Greek art ends with Hellenism. And at that point, when Greece is a province of Rome, it's just Roman art. The Hellenistic period ends in 31 BC with the Roman conquest at the Battle of Actium and the subsequent fall of the Ptolemaic Empire in the year following. With this, coinage in ancient Greece changes as Roman coinage is preferred and seen as more valuable. Imperial Rome still allows Greek city-states to produce their own coin though. They allowed this for local trade and as a matter of expediency and to allow that kind of smooth transition into Roman rule. Our coin that we have here is incredibly worn. It's actually quite difficult to discern the images, but not impossible. Our catalog states that this is Minerva or Athena, uh, but it makes sense that it would be Minerva, the Roman equivalent to Athena. And the reverse features some lumps that could potentially be Athena and Minerva's uh, owl. I do believe that this is correct. It falls in line with similar coins and numismatics of the time. And here is a similar coin with Minerva on the obverse in what is really a Corinthian helmet and an owl on the reverse. Both of these coins are made of bronze, which was typical of Roman provincial coin. At this point, they stopped being made of gold. Sometimes they were made of silver and occasionally villain. These coins were both dated 81 to 161 BC, which would be the era of Domitian to Antoninus Pius. And then our last coin that I'll show you from the Roman provincial period is this coin, which is just labeled coin Hadrian, dated 125 to 128 CE. This is typical of the Roman period where we see a current ruler in profile with an image of state, in this case, a Roman galley or trireme. For comparison, I wanted to include this image from our collection of the ancient trireme according to Bathius, Schaefer, and others. It's a port broadside view of a vessel with a curved prow, much like our coin here, and coins that we have previously seen with either a galley or potentially a trireme. This, is, uh, this includes a large steering oar at the stern, and a total of 10 oars on each side divided among three rows, which appears to be what we're seeing here. These oars do not seem to be in one row, but rather in at least two with rowers on board. And here is a similar coin that I was able to find where we can see Hadrian in profile wearing a laureate much like ours, that is actually tied at the back and we can see his wavy locks uh, held back by that laureate. Both coins include an inscription that says Hadrianus Augustus and these are both made of bronze despite the fact that this coin looks to be made of silver. Now before I end, I do want to show a similar image of a Roman work of art. Roman Republican period art was produced in service to the state, much like coin. These works of art extolled the values of hard work, wisdom, and age. They use something called verism or their veristic, which is a very naturalistic depiction that is known as a warts and all appearance. Rather than being idealized, it was preferable to show the wrinkles that are typical of age and show that you were an obedient servant to your state. They were often produced in service to aggrandize in the ruler and potentially his family. And they were meant uh, with each new statue to indicate shifts in power. Now, finally, I want to share with you my favorite coin. Normally, I don't like to play favorites and it would be difficult for me to choose a favorite among such a wonderful and unique collection. And I love it because it is not quite perfect. But in this case, it was easy because I love to maybe create a little controversy. 
Here we have a coin from the classical period that features Heracles fighting the Nemean lion on the reverse. And on the obverse is an image of a deity who our catalog names Athena wearing a Corinthian helmet. This could be true and it would match similar coins of similar dates. However, in those coins, Athena's helmet is heavily decorated with a sea serpent figure. We see heavy decoration in the hippocamp that lines that Corinthian helmet. And her face is also much more feminine. There is something not quite right about the facial features of this figure. I think that it might be Miltiades, like the tag states, and this would likely reference the Athenian general who, in 490 BCE, defeated the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. Could this be our hero? It makes sense, although I've yet to find a similar coin with Miltiades on the obverse. Maybe it could be the deity Zeus, Heracles' father, who was often depicted wearing a Corinthian helmet, but more often than not, I see him in a radiate headdress rather than Corinthian helmet with hippocamp. Or could this be Heracles himself wearing a Corinthian helmet? The face matches the coin here. They have a similar structure. However, when Heracles is seen on a coin like this, he's actually typically wearing the skin of the lion he has just defeated. Or maybe I'm just making something out of nothing and it really is just Athena. So with that, I would like to say thank you all for joining. Uh, I will take any questions and if you would like to further uh, ask any questions, I've included my email address as well as the link to uh, the Mariners Museum's catalogs. Hi, Jennifer. Okay, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Um, first, do you know if Alexander the Great established a single coinage through his empire? I don't believe he did. So we still see coins um, based on what I've been able to find where each individual city state uh, was still making their own coin. Um, and they still continue doing this even under Roman provincial rule uh, in order to have local trade. Um, and I don't remember seeing any coins specifically with Alexander the Great depicted on it because the Greeks would have seen this as far too prideful. Okay. And the second question is, do you have any idea how prevalent period counterfeit coins were in ancient Greece versus modern counterfeits to take advantage of collectors? Is there, is one type more common than the other? I don't know if one type is more common than the other. I do know that there was pretty prevalent counterfeiting in areas uh, outside of ancient Greece where coin was being used. Um, various areas, uh, modern day India, modern day Afghanistan, Iran, even into Egypt and the Levant, they were all making counterfeit coins so that they could essentially sell the or use the Athenian owl. I believe that the Athenian owl was the most often counterfeited coin because it was the most desirable for maritime trade. Um, and there are many areas that were counterfeiting them. I think it's actually likely that our counterfeit coin is dated properly. It was just made from one of those newer kingdoms um, that was set up, especially under Alexander the Great. Um, I do know that there are counterfeit coins that are still being made to trick collectors. There are many sites and booklets that I ran across on how to identify a counterfeit coin and how to know when it's real. Um, which one was made more than others? I'm not sure, but I'll try to find out. Great, thank you. Those were all the questions we had. So we appreciate your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. And uh, we thank our participants for joining us today. Thank you all so much.